Hey, this is Jeff Gannon, and you're listening to the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Andrew and I talk general investing concepts. To get even more content from me and Andrew, sign up for the Focus Compounding app. The Focus Compounding app costs $7.95 a month. It comes with a bunch of 2,000-word articles from me each week, a fresh batch of five-minute videos from the both of us, along with one bonus extra-long episode of the podcast each Saturday, and immediate access to our complete backlog of 200-plus episodes. To sign up, go to focuscompounding.com slash app or wherever apps are sold. And now here's Andrew with your regularly scheduled podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding. Thank you so much for tuning in with us here today. Jeff Gannon, how's it going today? Uh, it's going good, Andrew. How's it going? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else as well. In today's video, we're video and podcast, we're going to be talking about black boxes. Okay. So there's been a couple times you come across a company and we're like, well... This will be a very hard company to understand. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can't ever understand, you know, the whole business in its entirety. Um, and you have a couple of companies down that you wanted to go over. And that's Points International, which is a company that we've talked about on this podcast and have personally owned in the managed accounts or for the clients. Um, Alliance Data Systems, Currency Exchange International, Amark Precious Metals. And I think this idea probably came... Um, uh, to you for this podcast was because I actually sent you Currency Exchange International uh, a couple of days ago, and you're like, "Well, we could, you know, try learning about it." You said, "But you think it'd be very hard to learn about." And half a dozen people have sent me Alliance Data Systems, it, so it's the most common stock I get asked about is Alliance Data Systems. I really? never talk about the stock or anything, so yeah. Do you respond to them and talk about it with them, or I've tried to. I don't understand Alliance Data Systems all that well. Um, okay, so. Uh, this is a stock owned by Alan Meekum, um, some other people, some value investors that are pretty, uh, it's pretty popular with certain value investors. Um, it's kind of a distressed price today. Like it's come down a lot in price, but historically I've been seen as a strong comp compounder. Um, got it. So I guess when people reach out to you, like, what do they try to talk to you about? Is it just... Hey, what do you think about this company? And then you're like, well, I just don't think you can fully understand this business because it's a black box or how does that conversation usually go? Sure. And when we say black box, I, I mean, the company talks about what it does and everything. And certainly they don't see themselves that way. I would say that it can be uh, the idea about whether a company is a black box and all that has to do to a significant extent with how much they talk about things that you feel you can understand what they're saying and what actually drives the results in the business. So as an example, when I talked about Amark Precious Metals, I did a write-up of that for the um, website. I did feel that their secured lending business, in which they basically make loans similar to margin loans against physical gold that they, in many cases, that they hold in their own vaults, um, is an easy-to-understand business. And that's not a black box at all. Whereas things that are more market making activities could potentially be that. Mm -hmm. So there's aspects to a business that are very easy to understand aspects that aren't. We talked about farmer Mac. Mm -hmm. um, some of their things I think are very easy to understand. If they actually own a farm and ranch loan, for instance, it's fairly easy to understand what that is. Um, at other times they're doing certain things with their um, credit in a more institutional way. I guess they in fact call it institutional credit or something like that for part of it, um, which is a little different than actually owning the loans. So if I talk about the business, it might make it sound like I'm talking all about owning farm and ranch mortgages that are conforming. But actually, it's not their entire business. And that part of the business is the easiest to understand. Amar Precious Metals, their market making is actually the, um, the part of the business that's bigger. And it's a little more difficult to understand than the um, secured lending stuff. Mm -hmm. So I guess when you come across situations like this, is it almost easy just to put in the too hard pile and just go on to the next business? Or is that like, okay, other people may think in the same thing, so you should take a look and try to dig deeper? I try not to do that it took a while to analyze points international and try to figure out how the business worked and everything. Uh, we talked about it. I felt that management didn't do a great job of tr explaining, um, how I think the business actually worked. Um, and so that's kind of a complicated issue there. Um, they did some stuff on an agency basis and some on a principal basis. This affects the way the accounting works. Um, and because of that, they did do some things I liked, like they did focus people on gross profit, but I continue to read write-ups and stuff where people mention revenue. I think revenue is irrelevant at this company because they, you could basically 
by talking to your client, work out whether you want to do it on a revenue basis or a gross profit basis. Um, so I just don't, I, I mean, I don't think that that is useful. And if we see here, we can see gross profit stuff and the stability in gross profit versus what you saw in revenue. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that is a very big part of it is trying to figure out the accounting. So some of the black box stuff can have to do with the accounting. If we look at why I think Alliance Data Systems is, we can go there 10K. Um, why I think potentially something like that can be is because I don't know what I don't know in some cases about the company. And that presents problems for um, understanding how it, the business makes money, how management is talking to you about different things. Uh, if we go down, yeah. So they talk about their business. Mm -hmm. And the big thing that's very important is they say they have a client base of more than 400 companies, primarily large consumer brands. So basically companies that are, um, they do like store cards for retailers. That's the way you would know them best. Um, and particularly through their bank, uh, what is it, Comenity. Um, you would recognize them if you have a Comenity card. Um, and usually the competitor that you would know would be Synchrony. That's the other one yep. that you might know. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of, I would say that kind of um, c credit card is what people are most familiar with. But if you go down, there's some different stuff in the financials that shows up in this. So here we go. So like um, receivables, financing stuff. But if you go down further, there's just words in it that shows you that the complications of the accounting and everything. So if you, I mean, you can you do a search on it? If sure. You, yeah. So if you search, for instance, you can do, um, try searching for VIE. Yeah. So they have variable interest entities. Uh, do a search for conduit. See if they ever use that word. Uh, UIT. Yep. Yeah. So they have conduit facilities, for instance. You could also do a search for securitization. What's a conduit facility? Um, <laughs> so it's exactly what they say there. Non-recourse borrowings of consolidated securitization entities. Okay. What so, does that mean? <laughs> all right. So that's a good question. Um, what do each of those words mean? So consolidated means that it's... So consolidated means that they're consolidating it on their financial statements, um, where some things might be unconsolidated. Securitization means that they've securitized something. Um, they've taken something that would normally be a balance sheet item and turned it into a security instead of keeping it on the balance sheet. And then entities, we just talked about that, variable interest entities and things like that. And then non-recourse means that the um, borrower in the case of default and stuff won't be able to collect from, um, from Alliance data systems. So as an example here, I've talked about Carmart before. I think Carmart is much easier to understand than other um, subprime lenders in, in car stuff because they don't securitize their financials. So you can do calculations based on the receivables and stuff they collected themselves. Certain other companies that people like in the industry and obviously can grow faster because they don't tie up capital by doing this, um, simply do blanket programs where the dealers make the loans. And as long as the loan conforms to a, a sheet of terms, that the company has, um, they agree to then immediately take the loan on. So they basically make it and then s give it to them that way. And then you can securitize those. Um, and I think that that's a different business that way. So because of those things, it can become difficult to understand how much um, leverage the company might be using in if we're getting complicated about the things that are consolidated and not consolidated and all of that in particular, what can become difficult to understand, I think for these kinds of companies is how quickly they need to get things off of their books and what would happen if the market for their types of security seizes up. So if your business is doing farm and ranch loans or student loans or whatever sort of thing, what if you turn around and no one's willing to buy it? It's like, Oh wait, right? Yeah. So what if that happens? Um, but it's non-recourse. So how does that tie into everything? Well, it's non-recourse to them, but that yeah. doesn't mean that they're, you're still, you're still having the, sec the security that you're selling is still based on the cash flows of the collection of the debt, just like it would be with whatever you put in there as, as an example, um, NACO's debt is all non-recourse. 
Yeah. Right. So NACO, over time, if they take money, which they have done, and invest in things which are no longer part of the subsidiaries which are tied to the mining of coal, technically what they're doing is weakening the position of the creditor over time um, by doing that uh, because we as shareholders may be able to access cash that they take out and put into other businesses. But it does not improve the credit profile of NACO because they're taking it out of something which the creditors are entitled to and moving into other things. Now, the free cash flow that they're generating at a mine is their main source of profit. So it, it makes, you know, it makes sense that um, that the fact that it's not recourse isn't very helpful, it, you know, the, that it's almost as good as having a B recourse. But in other cases, it's not. So like, for instance, NACO has um, meaningful natural gas. Well, that could drive the stock price, but it won't help um, the debt. Because cash flow from the um, from the uh, natural gas operations wouldn't be in the same subsidiary as owes the debt. Got it. What is another keyword that you wanted me to look up before that one or after that one? Uh, I think that that's it that way. I mean, um, so you can see they have what else do they have? There's some other things. Type in derivatives. So they do have this one line that I thought was a little odd. Let's they might have too many derivatives yeah, we could words go. because of that. Okay, yeah. Instruments. Oh, yeah, here we go. So the company uses derivatives to manage exposure to various financial risks. The company does not enter into derivatives for trading or other speculative purposes. Um, here we go, lower down. So that's the normal language. There then is a sentence that is, you go up more. There's a sentence, keep going up, stop. There's a sentence that the company includes, which is not normally included in 10Ks here. So just so everyone knows, when you read a 10K, you usually see under the line derivative instruments, the language, the company uses derivatives to manage its exposure to various financial risks. The company does not enter into derivatives for trading or other speculative purposes. Understand that's all that. normal. Okay. Then that's the exact language you expect. Then there's language you don't expect here. Certain derivatives used to manage the company's exposure to foreign currency exchange rate movements are not designated as hedges and do not qualify for hedge accounting. What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but like, what does the company mean? By that's what I'm saying. saying. Yeah. I don't know. And it shows up where they have gains and losses on it sometimes for that reason. Huh. So does it not count because they intended to use it as a hedge and they made mistakes and it wasn't did not behave as a hedge the way that they expected? Did it was it never intended to behave as a hedge? In which case, what were they doing? Um, I don't know. It's is it a big deal? No, you can look in their financials and see that the items related to their foreign currency stuff is small, but the sentence jumped out at me um so then below that it has derivatives designated as hedging instruments and has all that language which is normally what you expect to see um so if they do have hedging of foreign currency then there'll be a description of the derivatives de designated as hedging but remember this company did just say that it it uses certain derivatives to manage its exposure to foreign, foreign currency movements but they don't designate them as hedges and they do not qualify for hedge accounting I don't know exactly what that means. And it's a interesting uh, question of what it does mean and why they're using it. So do a lot of people reach out to you because they own the stock already or because they're just thinking about investing it's in it? It's a very popular stock with value investors, I would say. Like I said, compounder type thing. Uh -huh. it's, it seems to be very popular. <laughs> what about Currency Exchange International? Right. So you sent me this one and I find it difficult to understand exactly what it's doing and stuff because of the difficulty of finding out the size of what they're engaged in. And we could find the same thing. It's on uh, uh, SCDAR if you wanted to look at it. Or does the company have it? stuff on its own website that would be easy to find. yeah i think, think they do let's see so the company's doing currency exchange stuff some of that's easy to figure out on the retail stuff with their branches but then they have a major wholesale business and then that would depend on things which i was talking to you about which is like to me again having to do with the same as points international the difficult thing is it's kind of like saying i always give the comparison of ad agencies when you look at finances for ad agencies, you have to remember that you're looking at the revenue of the agency and you're not looking at the billings. Mm -hmm. And this is very important to differentiate the two. Here we have exchange volume, right? Yep. So this is where I see the. So you see exchange volume. Is this in dollars, uh, US dollars? It is, yep. So they report everything in US dollars, even though they're a Canadian company? Yeah. Okay. They're actually a US company, but they yeah, list All amounts in the support are stated in USD and are based on fiscal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So their exchange volume is very large. Right, so four point nine billion. Yeah. Right, but then their total revenue is only forty two um, million, which is what they're reporting in revenue. So if you take forty two million and you divide into forty nine at uh, four point nine billion, then obviously we're talking about them capturing less than one percent 
of uh, exchange volume as revenue. And then it's even lower for the purposes of like their earnings and stuff like that. So that's the major issue here is that we're just seeing that spread between those two things, which means uh, between the two numbers, if you divide one number into the other, which gives you some idea of the, when we talk about black boxes and stuff of the issues of this is that you'd have to understand what they're doing and how they're getting a spread and what that spread is and all of that. They're doing a huge, a huge volume of business for a small amount of revenue, mm -hmm. which is not inconsistent with some of the other companies we talked about, Points International, but also Amar Precious Metals, some of the things they do. Some of the market making activities are very, very small spreads. And so there's a certain leverage inherent in that when you do that. Does it seem like a lot of black boxes or companies that are like financial businesses yes. of some sort? Yeah. You know? The reason why your black box is going to be a financial company always is because it doesn't take anything. It's like Buffett says, you know, um, there, there's no physical constraints on capacity in the insurance industry, it is just psychological. If companies are willing to write it, then it'll happen. Um, you, the same thing with financial companies of this kind, which is different than banks and things like that, they're getting their deposits from, company, from companies and individuals, is that there's no need to do anything except get into the business. And that's how you grow very, very fast and that attracts people. Mm -hmm. You know, it w Similar like what we saw with the Lions data systems, right? If you can sign up partners, it's the co-branding of things with the partner and stuff, um, the retail partner, the retail partner is doing all the actual work for you. And that's true here where like the actual bank is creating the volume for you. And then you're piggybacking on that as like a wholesale relationship, the same thing there. So it's like a wholesale financial relationship is the things where these things can grow the fastest. And that's what I would say is the um, reason for it with Alliance Data Systems, why pe people are excited by that, is that actually if your client is, you know, um, Amazon or The Gap or Pier One or whatever, those places growing their stores and growing their customers is creating growth for you that you don't actually have to do. So you're piggybacking on that and you're just doing the financial aspect of it instead of growing it out yourself. Like if you had to grow out a branch network yourself, like the currency exchange one, um, a fair, they'll show you down there, the company owned branch locations. They basically s aren't growing that much anymore. Like they were, um, but they're, they're not that much uh, change as opposed to where you see yeah, the, the wholesale locations, relationships right? too. It's the wholesale relationships, the transacting locations. So it's not like they've been growing their branch network all that much. Um, whereas if they were growing their branch network all that much, then that's more of like impediment to growth that way. And so it tends to be less of a black box type relationship that way. Also, you have lower volume of exchange that you do at a higher um, margin. So we talked about that with like Western Union or things like that. Companies that do that sort of thing do, um, they are higher margin business because you're dealing with customers that have less bargaining power with you as opposed to those that have a lot of bargaining power in a bank relationship. Um, so I get asked a lot about these kinds of companies, mostly they're financial companies, but they don't have to be. And I would say the difficult parts of it are the kinds of things that we talked about here which is what is the definition of what's earnings? What is on your balance sheet and what is off your balance sheet? Um, but we talk about that even with things like NACA where they consolidate things or don't. Um, I talked to you recently about Flanagan's and stuff. They own about half of the cash flows for most of the businesses that they do. There's limited partners involved in all of the different businesses that they're in. So it does complicate the accounting there and stuff. And it means that the cash flows may be substantially different than the um, reported earnings, but they're fairly easy to understand. Where some other companies we've talked about, I've found their earnings to be difficult to understand. The best example of like a black box is GE. I read their 10K and stuff and decided not to go further writing up the company and, and things like that. I had intended to do it, but it was too difficult to reconcile the accounting with um, any way of like understanding the actual business in terms of the cash flows it generated. Does it make you nervous when you see companies similar to Points International and like currency exchange where it's like 4.8? you know, or $4.9 billion in volume, you know, and then their revenue derived from that, just such a minuscule amount. Yeah. Like well, that, is that like a tip off to be like, Hmm, like what's going on there? Well, it depends. So if ad agencies reported their billings, it would look like that. Uh, it wouldn't look like that. It wouldn't be a hundred to one, but it would look similar because it would make it so that they're, they might seem six or seven times or whatever, larger, um, than they are now. And people might think they're bigger companies than they are because of the amount of ad buying that they're doing on behalf of clients where it's just passing through on a commission basis. Um, 
But it doesn't really bother me because if I was looking at a broker or something, I would understand mm. a small amount of commissions that they have on a large amount of orders um, done for c clients, just as I would for an ad agency if they're buying and selling ad revenue that way. But if they mention stuff about that they're that they are doing stuff that's not on an agency basis or whatever, that say, for instance, if there was a question of are you buying and selling stuff speculatively, mm -hmm. right? That's totally different. So the same thing on if we're looking at a broker, if they're doing stuff on a principal basis for other reasons. Um, and if a lot of stuff is getting mixed in together, that's where it can become confusing. That was an issue with GE, right? There's a huge difference between you're doing a certain volume of business on behalf of clients and stuff. And then also mixed in with that is other stuff that has to do with more speculative things that you're doing. And I don't know, you know, in some cases, I don't know how to deal with those sorts of things about what it... The, the black box aspect of it usually happens when there's different kinds of earnings that are being mixed in together. That's the thing that happens with like GE. Analysts weren't paying attention to the fact of like the lower levels of the business. And also companies with individual product lines and stuff can't do this. So the more detail you get on specific sites, specific product lines, things like that, the better you are to under, be able to understand the company. If the company is mixing in all sorts of different things together, then it becomes very hard to understand the company. Um, and that's why I try to steer people away from very big banks usually, because it's hard to understand each of the components that you need to understand to learn about the banking business. Whereas if it's at a very small company, you can tell like, these are the loan losses, these mm -hmm. are whatever else, instead of a lot of different items that it's hard for you to understand getting mixed in with different types of loans and stuff at bigger companies. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and I on the Focus Compounding Podcast. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, both on YouTube and the podcast side of things. Thank you so much for all the support, and we will see you in the next podcast. Hey, this is Andrew Kuhn, and that was the Focus Compounding Podcast, the podcast where Jeff and I talk general investing concepts. To get even more content from me and Jeff, sign up for the Focus Compounding app. The Focus Compounding app costs $7.95 a month. It comes with a bunch of 2,000-word articles from Jeff each week, a fresh batch of five-minute videos from the both of us, along with one bonus extra long episode of the podcast each Saturday and immediate access to our complete backlog of 200 plus episodes. To sign up, go to focuscompounding.com slash app or wherever apps are sold. Thanks for listening and we'll see you in the next podcast.